So today we want to begin talking about the lecture on the essence of truth, like Sartre's existentialism is a humanism. This too was a lecture given by Heidegger. And if you can imagine sitting in this lecture, trying to make sense of what he was saying, you understand that it would be all but impossible unless you were already a student of his and had some sense of not only how he uses his terms, but what his stance on the history of philosophy is. Now, last time we did talk about his basic project in being in time, the question of being, correct? talked about the question of being. What does it mean to be? And his answer in being in time is that to be is to become present. And things become present in the present. And presencing is what we do. We bring things into an open space. Now, in this article, Heidegger is already talking about being. as almost appropriating Dasein. That freedom is not a property of us, but rather we belong to freedom. That being uses us in order to make itself present. Whereas in the earlier Heidegger, in Being in Time, the focus was more on Dasein itself as the open. Okay. But let's focus now on exactly what he's doing in this lecture. He's asking about truth. What is truth at bottom in its most fundamental character? And he begins with our common sense understanding of the meaning of truth. He talks about material truth and propositional truth. Now, we have talked about propositional truth. The truth of propositions is correspondence between the intellect and the thing. And if you did the reading, then you saw how you're using the Latin formulation, veritas est adequatio intellectus et re. Truth is a correspondence between intellect and thing, or a being. Okay. But propositional truth, he seems to suggest in this article, itself points back to an earlier conception of truth, a medieval conception of truth. Because in the medieval world, truth meant being what a thing is intended to be according to the divine plan of creation.
when I say that this is a true tree, I mean it's an actual tree, a real tree, as opposed to a counterfeit tree or a fake one. Meaning that it, the thing, the being, corresponds to God's plan. In the modern period, the correspondence was not between beings and the mind of God, but between human intellect and things. But at the heart of what he's arguing in the essence of truth lecture is that both material and propositional truth, which he calls veritas, using the Latin designation, okay, or the modern experience of truth, are derivative of a more primordial a more fundamental meaning of truth. And that is closer to the way the Greeks experienced truth. Truth as the unconcealment of things. And so when he refers to truth as unconcealment, which is a more original sense of truth. He uses the Greek term aletheia. When he refers to the truth of propositions, such as when I say the doors close, my proposition is guaranteed by the fact that the door actually is closed. Correspondence between the intellect and what is actual. But what does this unconcealment mean? It means simply, to give an example, that before I can say the door is closed and achieve truth in proposition. The being, the door, must come into the open. It must present itself. As he puts it in this lecture, it must traverse an open region, present itself to my consciousness. But what makes that open space Possible is what he calls hu human comportment toward beings. What is comportment? It's, it essentially means behavior. Okay? How you comport yourself, how you conduct your existence. Now, when I simply do something as simple as open the door. I let the door be the very thing that it is. I allow it to show itself as itself. Okay. But as we were discussing last time, for the most part, 
we comport ourselves in an everyday, average kind of way. In a way that renders our surroundings familiar, comfortable. And in fact, our familiarity with the world is so automatic and taken for granted that naturally when I deal with this or that, although I let these particular beings be, not by leaving them alone, quite the opposite, by engaging myself with them, by picking up the chalk and using it, that revealing at the same time, conceals something else. It conceals the mystery that there is anything at all. And in this lecture, he calls that mystery the mystery of being as a whole. Namely, the question of why there is anything at all, rather than nothing. I think the example of the door, like, um, letting the door be, is that our conception of the door, or is that our mm. perception of the door? Okay. Now, you're, you're talking in Kantian language. Instead of speaking in terms of faculties like Kant does. Although Heidegger is very much pursuing the same line of thought as Kant, he's asking what are the conditions that make a world possible? Heidegger talks in terms of the manner in which we temporalize time. Now, I'm using being in time language here. But for the most part, we seduce ourselves with the conception that there is plenty of time, that there's always tomorrow, as opposed to actively anticipating the one possibility which can't be outstripped, the possibility of my own death. He makes a very fleeting reference to it in this lecture, and it's easy to walk right past and not see. And I think on Thursday, I'll, I'll find it for you. It isn't that I have a perception of the, the being, in this case the door, and then synthesize that perception with certain concepts, like the concept that it exists and that it is, that it has possibilities of being open and closed. Rather, for Heidegger, we exist, which means 
that we stand open for the manifestation of beings. And for the most part, I do this simply through my familiarity with things. Okay. Now, when I am engaged with things, when I open and close the door, when I use the piece of chalk, when I look at the clock to check the time, I let these things be. Be what? Be the things that they are. But of course, I can, I can also conceal the meaning of these things, which is what Heidegger refers to here as untruth in the form of errancy or error. Like when I dominate something with an inappropriate understanding of the thing it is. Remember the truth here means unconcealing. or disclosing, okay? When Dasein, or human being here, becomes so self-assured and dogmatic about its interpretation of the world. Then it dominates that world and as I put it in my dissertation it's almost as if Dasein casts its own shadow into the open and eclipses beings in their being. Whereas to let things be in an authentic way is to let the possibilities for things show themselves, and in doing so, I allow the meaning of my own being to show itself, to become unconcealed, to enter into the open. But that is the moment of anxiety. That's what Sark was talking about, by anguish by realizing that the world literally rests on my shoulders. Because without me, there is no world. A stone is worldless. It has only that meaning which I ascribe to it, or let it present. <coughs> so to backtrack a moment, the ordinary conception of truth, the commonsensical, conception of truth. Like when I say, it is true that the lights are on, or this is a true piece of gold as opposed to a counterfeit piece of gold.
always involves a kind of accordance or correspondence. When I say this is true gold, I mean that this being accords with what gold is supposed to be, or my idea of what gold is supposed to be. When I say that it is true that the door is closed, my statement or proposition accords with the way things are. But before that sort of accordance is possible, first, things must come into the open. And what ruptures that space is us. We create room for beings to be by our free comportment toward being. And so, Heidegger says that the essence of truth in this more original sense, and by essence again, of course, we mean what truth at bottom is what makes truth truth is freedom <clears throat> my free interaction with things is the essential element that allows there to be anything at all, such that sometime later they can accord with our ideas or our statements. But if the essence of truth is freedom, then in order to understand truth, we have to understand what he means by freedom. And he tells us freedom is letting beings be. But letting them be themselves. Letting them speak for themselves. But untruth, as the opposite of truth, must then be a concealing or a closing off. And there are different ways in which we can exist in untruth. I can simply make errors, but there's, as there is a fundamental sense of truth as unconcealing, there is also a, a fundamental truth, or a fundamental sense of untruth, because all conceal, all unconcealing, or disclosing, opening up a space within which things can arise to presence at the same time must conceal something else. When I'm engaged in my daily affairs, I 
I let beings be. But in so doing, of course, what gets covered up is the fact that this letting be is the result of my freedom. And in fact, I forget that I am free to comport myself in one way or another. It's easier to hide out in the anonymity of the ordinary, everyday interpretation of things. But when the possibility the one possibility which cannot but be actualized, namely the possibility of my death, enters into the open. Then I become individualized because nobody can die my death for me. I can't experience my death as everyone experiences it because I don't know how anyone else experiences it. And so with the disclosure of the possibility of my no longer being here, comes the anxiety of realizing how radically free we are. And toward the end of the article, he uses this self-admittedly <coughs> paradoxical, even cryptic, or deliberately confounding expression that the essence of truth is the truth of essence. And he says, am I just playing word games here? Am I just trying to sound profound? Is this a bunch of nonsense? Well, let's unpack it. The essence of truth, what makes truth as presencing unconcealment possible, is the unconcealing of the essence of things. The essence of truth is the activity of letting the essence of things show themselves, show itself. And perhaps the most frightening disclosure possible is when I disclose my own essence. And for Heidegger, 
I do have an essence, which is why he didn't want to be called an existentialist. The essence of Dasein is to exist, to exist, to stand open. But to stand open, to be open, to unfamiliar possibilities. requires resolve. It doesn't happen automatically. Our default comportment is to flee into the anonymity of the world. But when I resolve upon letting possibilities that had hitherto remained concealed come into the open. In the realization that I myself, in my freedom, am the ground of possibility. Then there is no one left to hide behind. And when I when I when I expose myself in that way, expose myself to myself as having been hiding out in concealment, my conscience tears me out of that anonymity. And I experience it as guilt. Guilt for having not owned my freedom. Okay. So if you haven't yet attempted to read this thing, try it. The fr it's, it, it's interesting because the first few paragraphs are not that difficult, but then suddenly things turn. Okay? And we'll look at some of the passages next time. When you use that last part, consciousness happens when you realize you're not taking advantage of our freedom. You feel guilty. In Being in Time, he calls it the call of conscience, which is authentic Dasein calling itself back to itself. It's like we, we are hiding in the anyone, in the no one, and we hear the voice of conscience beckoning us back to ourselves. It's like the devil shows his face. Uh, yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah.